in the vocabulary of design, we talked about the uh, the terminology, <clears throat> the vernacular of visual communication. And if you haven't watched that, you need to see that before you watch this video on contrast, balance, and harmony. Because this gets into the grammar of design. Okay, It takes those terms that we talked about and it starts using them in design sentences, if you will, in order to, to better come to... Um, not just an understanding of design, but an ability to go through maybe and, and critique it. In class, uh, I would bring up this image and I would ask students, I uh, would ask you, um, you know, what do you see here? What's going on? And, and, and in terms of that vocabulary of design, certainly we're seeing line and uh, form and texture uh, happening within this. Not to color so much because it's monochromatic, but we can't discount the values involved in the um, in the grayscale of this image and what's happening with it. Anyway, it comes together. This I, I ask, is it is it balanced? Is it harmonious? You know, is there contrast going on? And and typically the answers are, yeah, you know, it, it looks like it's off balance, but then the, the way the beam cuts across the top, that lends itself some kind of balance. And there's harmony in, it's, in all of its lines come together and what's happening. Anyway, the, the point being is, is all these elements come together and they start to play on each other. And within that, they form contrast. They get into balance. There, there's some level of harmony going on. And, and while this image might not look that way, um, to the untrained eye, it's all there. All those elements are there in terms of contrast, balance, and harmony and how they relate to the vocabulary of, of uh, line, form, shape, shadow, shadow. <laughs> Um, I'm adding uh, more vocabulary here. Nothing's really restrictive in terms of uh, that vocabulary as we get into it. Those are the main terms, though, that we want to talk about. So for this video, I want to get into contrast, balance, and harmony. The first idea here is contrast. And uh, Skip Rutledge goes through and, and uh, he defines this as, he says, designs largely an exercise in creating or suggesting contrast which are used to define hierarchy or manipulate certain widely understood relationships and exploit context, uh, there's that word context, to enhance or redefine these relationships all in an effort to convey meaning. Um, I've said before in talking about context that meaning doesn't exist without a correlation of context. Well, contrast takes context, takes that contextual meaning and puts it on a continuum. Right, a spectrum to where we start to go through and, and compare because nothing has meaning by itself. You need to understand that. In order for us to derive meaning in visual communication, we need to be able to see that within its environment, within its context that gives us realm, it gives us scope, it, it gives us uh, a sense of its relationship to something else that way. So contrast, really, if you're... Um, if you're a photographer, you would go through and say, well, contrast really is just uh, uh, opposites and light and shadow and highlights and, and shadow in terms of what we've got going on. And certainly that's the case. Um, a number of years ago, I set up, I had a classroom on campus that was uh, large enough for me to set up my photography lights and I created a little studio in there. And, and if I came across um, students who, um, who had uh, interesting features I asked if I can go through and, and uh, photograph them. I usually just do it right after class, take five minutes, sit them down, go through and release a shutter. And so that's what you're seeing here to give you context as far as these images are concerned. And in this one here, we're, the contrast is obvious in terms of the highlight and shadow. We have 90% uh, uh, highlights going on here, and then we have really inky blacks going on in this as well. But then we have um, obviously a range of that happening within this too. The range is pretty far out. There's not a whole lot of grayscale going on, but there's enough to go through and, and depict skin tones, um, to pull uh, dimensions and detail out of the hair. Uh, the hoodie goes through and frames out her face and then a double frame with the hair as well and the black in the background. All these things come together. This is a, a typical example of what contrast can do in terms of highlight and shadow, okay? And those extremes are easy to define because they they exist along, like I said, this dichotomy, this spectrum of what's going on. Here's another image here. And things are getting a little bit more subtle now. Now we're not just talking in terms of highlight and shadow because now we have contrast in other areas like texture, for example, the texture of the, uh, 
the uh, trim on the hoodie, the, the texture of the hoodie itself, the texture of her complexion, of her hair, of the kind of the sheepskin down the lower left-hand corner. All these things now are starting to combine and give us a little bit more contrast. So meaning is defined by value as well, something that is relative to something else. And we have to usually dig a little deeper for value. Sometimes we can recognize it in a photograph, and, and sometimes we might need to have some other explanation going on here. Matt was a student of mine, and we became close friends uh, uh, since that time. And uh, if you look at this portrait that I did of him, you see some traditional Rembrandt lighting going on. I have a, an out of focus or shallow depth of field with the uh, motorcycle in the background. And unless you knew Matt's story in terms of the value of that, it, it really doesn't mean anything other than, oh, he must ride a motorcycle. But this is a guy who survived a traumatic brain injury on a motorcycle and uh, lived to tell about it. Turned around, turned his life around. He, he lost his ability to ambulate, to speak, um, and was in through... Therapy and a lot of his determination and hard work was able to get back 100% in order to be able to, to walk and, and to speak and, and do those things. And then, and then came to Dixie um, to start uh, his education that way, and that's where we met. So now you know the story, the backstory of this. Matt still rides to this day, in fact, and now you know that backstory. Now you have a little bit more value in terms of what this image might mean. So contrast really can be broken down into a number of areas in terms of uh, contrast, like size uh, or texture or position, color, shape, and lastly, orientation. So these are the, the categories we'll talk about contrast. It's not limited to these, okay? But these are the ones that really for our intent and intents and purposes here in terms of studying visual communication and design uh, will work out for us. So let's start off with size first off and size can be sometimes confused with orientation and um, uh, maybe uh, scale scope that kind of thing but we'll, we'll talk about that here as we get into it um, we've seen this image before we saw this in the vocabulary design this was taken uh, on the san diego harbor looking across uh, back towards um, uh, the, the base that's over there i can't remember the name of it um, it's terrible i can't remember that anyway there's a, a this aircraft carrier there and then we have these uh, pleasure craft, the, the sailboats uh, happening within that. And certainly there's a contrast there between a battleship and a pleasure craft, okay? Um, but there's there's a size contrast, obviously. One's huge and the other ones are tiny. That's the most obvious contrast that's going on there. Here's one for size. Um, Jed, uh, an individual who's a bodybuilder, asked me to photograph him. And he happened to have his, uh, his wife showed up at our shoot along with his little boy. And, and so... Um, we decided to put them together to give us some of that contrast in size to see uh, what's going on here. It's one of my favorite things. Texture is uh, is a, another element of contrast, and certainly there's that uh, dichotomy to that in terms of what's rough and what's uh, smooth nature is the palette of texture really for us to see what's going on out there. If you look at this one, you see some of the obvious ideas in terms of texture as far as the ground, the volcanic rock, the sand. Um, but if you look at the fuzzy leaves below the petals of these flowers, the flowers themselves, the silkiness of those things, um, lots of contrast happening in terms of that texture. Same thing going on here. We have this Kaibab limestone. This is the, 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 the overlook in Zion Canyon, looking back uh, south into the canyon. Angel's Landing will be just over on your right, and this is about 900 feet above Angel's Landing. The contrast here is in the, the surface area of that uh, brass uh, survey mark that's there that contrasts against the, the, the sandy uh, Kaiban limestone that's going on. Position, where things are and how they maybe compare to each other, uh, gives us contrast, gives us scope and scale, this the huge monolith that uh, is in, I think this is uh, Warm Springs Bay in on Lake Powell, and then in comparison to my kayaking companion there in the, uh, in the foreground of that. Position of where we are experiencing the photograph or the sculpture or the automobile or the architecture uh, comes into place, especially architecture in terms of how we interface it within our position within that. 
a number of years ago, I, I uh, produced a documentary on the Mountain Meadow Massacre, and I was asked a few years later to kind of revisit the Mountain Meadow area and uh, to do some photography that would go towards the uh, retelling of that story. And while I was out there, I was looking at um, the... It's a long story. I won't get into it. This is a place where 121 people were, were massacred by uh, members of the Mormon militia back in 1857. It happened on September 11th, ironically, in 1857. And so I wondered if if I had fallen by the bullet of, of another individual and into a scrub oak um, or a mesquite, and what would the last thing be that I would have seen before I, I closed my eyes in death. And, and so this is what I came up with. And I, I, I took my Canon, uh, put on a self timer. I put a wide angle lens on it. I went through and adjusted the polarizer just right. And then I released the shutter. I placed the camera down inside the plant, giving it that position, that point of view, looking up and release the shutter. And that's what we've got here. So position, uh, I could have shot it from above it. I could have shot it from the side. But from inside looking up gives us an entirely different effect of consequence. Color, certainly. Now, you're thinking, wait a minute, Eric. We've already gone all over these terms. And yeah, while I'm talking about color and texture, uh, which are part of the vocabulary of design, they also factor into this the sentences of contrast and what they put out there. So we know color's got value and, and hue, intensity, those types of things. Um, then there's a contrast within that. So I, I released a shutter on this um, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Monument Valley and was using a lens, an old lens actually, that goes through and gives um, the coatings on it, give it just this incredible muted colors and yet it's able to go through and pull out this uh, this depth and texture uh, in what's going on as compared to uh, this on the other side of the scale shot with an iPhone where the colors are popping um, on on the bluffs there this is out near um, Virgin Utah there so those color gives us a range within hue and, and value and intensity as well as far as that contrast is concerned as much as I love color Black and white, to me, incubates structure, and it forces my eye away from that beautiful persuasion of chromance, of color. And that's why, when I'm, as a photographer, when I'm shooting portraits, I like to shoot them in black and white, because it gets me away from that beauty of color and gets me into structure, into texture. It forces me to go through and examine what's happening within that. Look at the textures involved here. This is Jack Jack, the son of a very good friend of mine when he was a way little kid. And uh, look at the uh, the texture on the bottom lip, the highlight there that's coming off that. And almost that sheen there it almost looks like a, like a clear plastic that's happening within that. Or the, the complexion, the, the darkness of the eyes, the, the delicacy of the hair. It's um, It speaks volumes that way. If this were in color, I, I'm not convinced that we would be all that aware of what's going on. Or this shot of, of Patrick. It has a very shallow depth of field which goes through and mutes texture and forces your eye into what's in focus in terms of form and texture, what's happening within that. So while color certainly has its contrast, we can remove color and find contrast within its monochrominance. Almost invented a new word there. All right, shape is next along the line. And uh, certainly the size of shape or what shape introduces to our, uh, to our, our consciousness, what that means. This is uh, Rainbow Bridge in, uh, at Lake Powell. And certainly there is a, a stream of consciousness that, that exists culturally within this, with the indigenous people of that area, a place where they felt that the gods would pass through within that. Well, the shape of that arch um, leads minds to go through and add meaning to them contextually that might be more ethereal, that might be out there that way. So while this is a, a natural shape going on, we obviously also have man-made shapes. This is a um, uh, an art installation. We were in Volterra, Italy, driving along, um, coming out of the town. We came across this uh, this 
circle in this field, not in the middle of nowhere, but certainly not in any kind of urban environment. And this road, it was not well traveled uh, as well. And we were amazed by that. My wife stepped out of the vehicle and, and uh, took this picture. We walked around it and, and looked at it. Um, this is by Mauro Staccioli, and it's from an art installation called um, Fare Arte. If you get a chance to look it up, I, uh, I would encourage you to do so. But what he's doing here is he's taking shape and putting it in context that uh, kind of defies. Uh, it certainly is a huge contrast to what's happening around it there in terms of culture. Orientation, the way objects are placed within a layout, um, what they mean to each other. Um, while I was at uh, Monument Valley not too long ago, um, I showed you the image that I took, and then I stepped back and uh, looked at the vehicle that we explore with and, and uh, saw its relationship. When I took the photograph, I didn't initially look at this as what's called a forced perspective, okay, in terms of the vehicle's relationship to that bluff. Um, in fact, it was somebody else who pointed out to me and said, wow, that's an amazing forced perspective photograph where the vehicle looks like it's, it, it's almost as big as the bluff. And that's orientation, the placement of objects. And since those objects along that z-axis, okay, from front to back, are in focus, it perpetuates that illusion there of forced perspective, as opposed to this, where things are a little bit more uh, oriented in terms of scale and scope that way. Uh, here's a, an orientation shot out of the sunroof of our vehicles. We're leaving our favorite place in San Simeon after going kayaking there. This picture tells me all kinds of stories, only to me though, because I have context for what's going on here. You, if you have never done it, you don't have that kind of context. But that's what happens in the contrast here of orientation. That's the one that, that tells most of the stories that um, we get into. So contrast, size, texture, position, color, shape, and orientation, okay? These are terms you need to know, and uh, if you need to, go back and watch the video again, take careful notes. What I find really is one of the best ways for me to understand this is to go out and do uh, either take pictures that go through and um, that capitalize on each one of these ideas or go online and find images and, and make your own design book to go through and help you synthesize what this stuff means that way. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's get into uh, balance. We talked about contrast. Let's get into balance. And this one's pretty simple because uh, it boils down to three areas, symmetrical, asymmetrical, and radial balance. And perhaps the most sophisticated one of these is asymmetrical. We'll get to that here in just a minute. Symmetry is pretty straightforward, and nature shows us symmetry almost everywhere we look, okay? It's where we have this complete balance, left, right, top, bottom kind of thing going on. And even on microscopic levels, nature has this ability to go through and just blow our minds with things like this snowflake crystal. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I mean, the, the mathematics that exist out there in order to go through and do the physics that are involved um, all come together in this this visual impact. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and their symmetry exists in other places, so obviously. It exists in web design. It exists in architectural design. Here we have um, almost a... Uh, you might be comfortable in this kind of symmetry um, or, or this kind of symmetry, or maybe it drives you nuts and, and you got you to go through and move something to where, you know, we, we get something else, some other type of asymmetry instead. I'm more comfortable in something like this that allows the eye to go through and move. Things to me that are symmetrical, the eye becomes static. There's no movement. There's no reason to go through and look around. Where these kind of invite the eye architecturally to go through and, and make that journey. And, and again, we're conditioned with, with symmetry. With, I'm sorry, we're conditioned with asymmetry just as much as we're conditioned with symmetry. Our best art out there is asymmetrical. It goes through and again leads the eye. That's the, I, th I think the litmus test of something that is truly asymmetrical is that your eye goes through and makes a journey throughout the, uh, the image. So I'm going to show you um, three double truck ads that were designed by a student for the, the last project in this class. This was last semester. 
the client uh, was uh, Whiptail Biking Company. They're um, um, an adventure biking company. And she went through and did what's called a double truck ad, meaning that if you were looking at a biking magazine and you turn the page, both pages then would, would contain this, this ad. In fact, these three ads as they go. And they're great examples of this asymmetrical approach in terms of its balance. That's a great example of a lot of things, but uh, the balance is what we're talking about here and what she's able to uh, pull off. The asymmetry gives us motion. It gives us direction. It's not static. Um, the room ahead of the cyclist goes through and, and lets us know that uh, you know that they can go through and progress. Um, the weight of things that are going on in terms of the highlight and shadow, the, the highlight of the sky with the hashtag change gears, and how that weighs out against the logo of Whiptail Biking Company down the left-hand side. The same thing going on over here, though we, we've we've taken that hashtag and moved it over, but the balance comes back into perspective with the with the mountain back rider coming right up against the frame, and and that framing there goes through and gives you just a little bit of some some dissonance, like he's he, there's not enough room for him to go into. It's a good thing he stopped, you know, or or what's next. That's the affective consequence of this, right? People want to see themselves within this. What's he looking at? You know, what, what's going on there? And this is where design works. It works really well. Radial balance is probably the, the easiest one to identify. And if you Google this, you'll come up with all kinds of kind of kaleidoscopish kinds of stuff. And, um, and that's cool. You know, that's pretty straightforward. But... <laughs> I'm a car guy. If we haven't had this conversation yet, uh, we'll have it, unfortunately, a little bit later on. Um, but I'm a car guy, and to me, radial balance exists within automotive design. And I can't think, really honestly, of anything more beautiful than this. <laughs> it's a nardy steering wheel inside a, a Ferrari California Spider, 1962. What's fascinating about this wheel is it, this used to have four spokes to it. Now, even though it's a radial design, we're into some asymmetry, okay, in terms of the three-spoke versus the four-spoke. The four-spoke, if you can imagine a four-spoke coming out the top and then the two horizontal spokes going more horizontal, okay, and the whole wheel was completely um, symmetrically radial that way. And Enzo Ferrari wasn't a fan of that and turned to the designers at Nardi and asked for a new wheel to be designed. And what did Ferrari do? He designs a whole car around the wheel to introduce that, which is pretty amazing. It wasn't the California Spider, though. It's, I can't find an image of it here. But look at the, look, at, it's a beautiful photograph as well. But you see what the radial balance of this is doing for the eye and how it how it frames up the instrument clusters, also radial design in the back. Or what about this, the second most beautiful <laughs> radial design in terms of the weaving the, of the spokes on this wheel. You know, what's, tr what's true, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. What's truly fascinating about old Ferraris in particular, like this one, this is a, a, a 250 Gran Turismo Omologato GTO. Is you see that lip around the fender again, a radial design going on with that. Um, that's that's done. That's aluminum first off, okay, and that's hand rolled with a large wooden dowel by some old Italian guy who goes through and sculpts that out. That's not a press, okay. That's not that doesn't come out of a machine. This car is hand built by 12, 12 Italians. Um, and, and the prices are amazing, they're astronomical. We'll get into those later on when we talk about uh, design domains. So, balance, okay? Uh, symmetry, asymmetry, and radial balance going on. Let's get into harmony. This is a little harder to define. You know, it's, it's something where you know it when you see it kind of a thing, right? Or you know dissonance when you see it. And dissonance really is a part of, of harmony. Dissonance is used to go through in visual communication to create that affective consequence, that affective consequence of dissonance uh, within this. And my best um, uh, definition is everything comes together. Okay, it all relates in color and shape and theme and you know all those words of the vocabulary of design start to work well within this. And the first image that comes to mind is this experience. Uh, I can't think of anything more harmonious uh, in my life outside of my relationship with my spouse and my kids and our kids. Uh, was this moment that we had out in the middle of a dry lake bed in the Mojave Desert when we lit um, these these uh, lanterns and set them aloft into the night sky. 
And I, I took this photograph of my spouse going through and just getting ready to release this one. I even get emotional talking about it because of the harmony that's here, because of the goodwill, because of the ascension, the spirituality of this. And, and you, you, know, you might not share that, and that's fine. It's not for everybody. You find your harmony. I find my harmony. We all have different influences. The influences here, though, are not just within the experience itself. The influences are within the complementary colors that you're seeing going on, the, the blue highlight in the lower left hand that, that's complementing the, uh, the ambers that are happening through this, um, the flame, the, the balance that's going on, the asymmetry of, this, of the big lantern against all the little tiny lanterns going up in the background of this. It's, it becomes harmonious. This is the only two shot I ever took in terms of that little um, studio that I set up in my classroom of this couple. And if you look at it closely, you see the harmony that's going on here in terms of their facial structures, the distance between the eyes, the length of the nose, not necessarily the shape of the mouth, but the position of what's going on there within that. There's, they're, they're beautiful, right? But there's more to it than that. That beauty stems from DNA because these are siblings. This is a brother and sister happening. And as all those shapes kind of come together, there's a harmony that exists within those distances that are going on there. It's pretty spectacular. Here's an interior design. Um, the harmony that's going on, the, the relationship of texture of the, uh, the rug to the, the wood floor to the tapestry. Uh, the textile coming down around the bathtub, the light as it goes through, all kinds of things that are happening. And the style of the furniture as that comes together in a theme, pulling things together harmoniously. And here's something that's a little more dissonant. Okay, But that dissonance then is created in terms of visual communication to make you go, oh, oh, wow. This was an effort to go through and, and raise awareness of children being drafted into the uh, the, the Coney uh, infantry and, and what was going on, um, making child soldiers, child terrorists out of these kids. Um, here's one. Um, <laughs> it, it deals with zombie culture, all right? It's nothing, it's very graphic there. And you, you better believe this is going through and creating dissonance. But if within that dissonance, look at the harmony that's happening within this in terms of of contrast and in terms of uh, of balance of what's going on there. Or this, this one, a design competition in, in 2011 in terms of harmony and what it does. And you might, it takes you a minute, the international typographic style, what, and how they've, we're talking topography, right? And they've taken topography and they've, they've cut it to pieces and they've laid it back out in this uh, diagonal way, creating some level of, of dissonance. But once you see it and understand it, it, it clicks in your brain and becomes harmonious. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then, of course, in web design, certainly harmony involved there. We'll talk a lot more about web design as we get into the axioms of web design and visual communication. So contrast, balance, and harmony. These, This is the grammar of visual communication that works hand-in-hand hand with that vocabulary.